towards the end of the uh, yesterday's class we have been talking about solutions uh, uh, of the uh, of the Ising model uh, essentially we are talking about uh, one dimension and um, uh, we have shown that there is a technique called as a transfer matrix approach which uh, allows you to calculate the partition function in a closed form and uh, this amounts to actually uh, solving a 2 by 2 matrix or rather uh, it is a multiplication of uh, n 2 by 2 matrices which are all identical and um, uh, then uh, you know one can calculate the partition function as stress of the sum of the eigenvalues this is uh, known that this is how the uh, the solutions of a 2 by 2 matrix comes about. So, all it uh, uh, boils down to is uh, calculating the eigenvalues and hence the eigenvectors which we have not used, but uh, we will uh, use that now and uh, get some properties of this uh, 1D Ising model. So, we will do a little bit of follow up on the transfer matrix approach and uh, then we will uh, talk about mean field theory. And uh, again uh, the, the third technique that we will be talking about is a renormalization group which is also known as a poor man's RG or it is also called as the Cadenoff uh, technique or Cadenoff transformation and uh, these uh, will um, wrap up the solutions of the 1D Ising model which shows a distinct uh, transition from the paramagnet to a ferromagnetic phase. Uh, and uh, this is possible in uh, any dimension which is greater than 2 and uh, exact solutions as I said are available in only 1 and 2 dimensions and uh, we are simplifying the discussion by following in uh, or rather uh, resorting to only one dimension and uh, but of course when we do the mean field theory you see that it is uh, you know kind of irrespective of dimension and, um, and then we will uh, do the renormalization group. So, uh, just a little follow up on the transfer matrix uh, that we did. So, we wrote down the partition function which is equal to um, you know lambda 1 to the power n and lambda 2 to the power n and uh, where lambda 1, 2 are uh, 1 and 2 these are the 2 eigenvalues which are written as exponential beta j. Uh, cosine hyperbolic uh, beta j plus minus uh, we have um, uh, this uh, exponential 2 beta j and uh, uh, plus uh, sine hyperbolic square uh, beta h plus exponential minus 2 beta j. Okay. And uh, this is uh, derived yesterday. These are the two eigenvalues where uh, j is the uh, nearest neighbor uh, interaction between the spins and uh, h is the effective magnetic field or just the magnetic field. Uh, there is a, a factor of this uh, magnetic moment uh, that is included there, but let us not worry about that. So, these are the two eigenvalues and uh, my z is or uh, the partition function is obtained in a closed form using the lambda 1 and lambda 2. And uh, as I said that uh, because of this plus and minus signs and then you have this uh, each of the eigenvalues is raised to the power n, uh, one can uh, neglect uh, these lambda 2 in front of uh, lambda 1. Lambda 2 corresponds to the negative eigenvalue and lambda 1 corresponds to the positive eigenvalue. So, lambda 1 is greater than lambda 2. So, lambda 1 to the power n is much much greater than lambda 2 to the power n and hence can be neglected. And uh, you can actually uh, write this down as uh, lambda 1 to the power n or even if that is not appealing to you uh, which should you know in the limit n going to infinity you can keep both lambda 1 and lambda 2 to the power n and uh, write down the free energy which is equal to minus kt uh, log of uh, lambda 1 to the power n plus uh, lambda 2 to the power n and this can be written as minus kt uh, n ln lambda 1 plus ln 1 plus lambda 2 by lambda 1. I have kept both these things. Let us put a second bracket here and hold to the power n and, um, and so this is the expression for the free energy and uh, you can now neglect this because it is uh, 
to the power n and then it is inside a log. So, we can simply write this as minus uh, n k t lambda 1. Okay. And uh, we have uh, worked out that uh, the magnetization is nothing but this derivative of the free energy with respect to the field and uh, if you do it carefully it comes out as sin hyperbolic beta h divided by root over of sin hyperbolic square beta h uh, plus exponential minus 4 beta j and uh, uh, it is very clear that uh, for h uh, equal to 0 m equal to 0. So, uh, no spontaneous magnetization which is what we uh, have learned. And this result as you will see that is in direct contrast with mean field theory. And uh, so, the mean field theory is infinitely wrong in one uh, dimension it becomes increasingly correct as you go to larger and larger dimensions. Okay. So, and of course, uh, you can see that for um, you know h not equal to 0 and beta to be large which means small temperature we have all of them to be pointing along the same direction. So, m actually tends to 1. Okay. So, these are the two limits that are of importance to us and uh, these limits have been in some form have been um, obtained in the uh, earlier as well when we have dealt with non interacting spins. And uh, now they uh, sort of uh, seem to give you similar results that is this 1D model has no spontaneous magnetization. So, uh, that uh, is like saying that the energy difference between the disordered state or a paramagnetic state and the ordered state which is ferromagnetic state is infinitesimally small. So, at no uh, finite temperature uh, the model uh, shows any uh, magnetic property or ferromagnetic property okay. uh, which means that uh, it is only at t equal to 0 and t equal to 0 is uh, really an ideal situation when uh, we are not uh, you know talking about exactly at t equal to 0. And we will see as I said that this result it contrasts with the uh, results obtained from the uh, from the mean field theory. But before that uh, let us uh, use uh, uh, to find this transfer matrix uh, to find the correlation function. So, uh, correlation function via the transfer matrix or correlation length you can say that which is a more physical phenomena. Uh, via the transfer matrix. So, what we mean is that uh, suppose you have an up spin at a site uh, say i and you have another up spin at a site which is say at a distance r apart r can be anything and r in principle goes to infinity for an infinite system. So, you ask this question that is what is the probability that if uh, I have a spin uh, up at a given site which is my reference. Uh, site and then at an instance capital R apart what is the probability that I get another spin which is also pointing up and this called as a spin spin correlation function. If in the limit R going to infinity I still have this probability to be large then this says that the system is ferromagnetically ordered and hence it represents a ferromagnetic phase of the model or of the system. A ferromagnetic state of the system and that is what we want to calculate that. Uh, so, what is the spin spin correlation function or uh, we can cast it in a different form that was the correlation length. So, what is the length over which two spins are correlated that is both are pointing up or both are pointing down. Okay. I mean in this case we are just assuming that the magnetic field is in the upward direction which will eventually you know uh, at the uh, ferromagnetic state all spins will be pointing in the direction of h okay. and h is upward. So, we are talking about the upward direction to be the favored direction. So, this correlation function let us write it uh, as some uh, two uh, you know sides of the system on the chain it is a one dimensional chain and um, implicitly here we have uh, 
assumed a periodic boundary condition such that the last spin and the first spin they are connected and they um, interact these spins interact via this uh, interaction term j. So, uh, we need to calculate uh, quantity such as uh, this, let me write it neatly. So, it is uh, um, SI um, minus the average of SI and SJ minus the average of SJ and you take the, um, the expectation or the average value of that. So, the, uh, this angular bracket that you see is actually the thermal average. Okay. So, which means that it has to be you know multiplied by exponential minus beta h and, and finally, take the trace and, and things like that. Okay. So, what we can assume is that if you have a translational invariance of the system, then each of these expectation values which are simple numbers should be equal to s and which we later call as a magnetization of the system. So, independent of the site indices i and j they have the same value which is expectation of s. Okay. And in this limit uh, the uh, gamma r i r j which is the correlation function I should define it. So, uh, r i r j is equal to gamma of uh, r i minus r j. Okay. So, uh, they do not depend upon or the rather the correlation function does not depend upon individual site indices, but is difference between the two sites and this is often done in physics um, in various branches where whenever you have a translational uh, invariance or there is a periodicity in real space, uh, then we do not need to talk about these two indices separately, these two lattice indices or site indices separately but we can talk about the difference between the two. So, it becomes from two variables it become uh, becomes just a, a one variable which is r i minus r j difference between the two sides. And this is then equal to if I open up the bracket it becomes equal to s i s j and minus s square okay, which is uh, this s i or s j that. Uh, so, if you look at the middle expression then it is equal to the second term which is s square. So, uh, the implicit assumption is that the spin correlation or the spin spin correlation uh, again uh, let me reiterate it means that was the probability that you have a, an up spin at a site i and uh, also there is an up spin at a site j where i and j are arbitrarily far apart. And this tells you that if this probability is large then we have a magnetic ordering in the system which means that every spin is pointing in the upward direction which corresponds to a ferromagnetic state of the system. And that is what we are uh, trying to find out. So, this uh, spin correlation function we just call it a spin correlation or you can call it a spin spin correlation. This actually dies exponentially rather. So, it dies away uh, as r tending to infinity in the sense that if these uh, uh, the two spins are very far apart the usual behavior is that it, it goes to 0. So, that uh, we can write this thing as the uh, gamma r i minus r j as uh, some exponential minus r i minus r j uh, divided by xi uh, or it can be written as exponential minus r over xi where r is equal to r i minus r j that is the mod of this. Okay. So, uh, now this spin correlation uh, dies adds r goes to infinity means that as you increase the distance from one side to another the probability that you would get again another um, you know up spin at an infinite distance really uh, dies out. And this is not only true for um, below T c that is below the transition temperature where the magnetic correlations occur. It is also true at T greater than T c. The only difference is that uh, that you have um, above T c you have uh, this equal to 0. Uh, this quantity is equal to 0 which is called as a magnetization and uh, below T c 
this quantity is not equal to 0, it is finite. But nevertheless, uh, this behavior stays as you uh, go from, uh, you know, as you, as you make the uh, distance between the two sides under consideration to be large enough. Okay. So, uh, let me uh, take uh, one site as uh, labeled as 1, 1 and uh, another site which is at a distance apart as r. Okay. So, we are trying to find out the correlation between uh, S1, SR kind of thing. Okay. So, this kind of uh, and will of course, uh, the limiting case for this for us to consider is capital R tending to infinity. So, what is then gamma of R which is the distance between the two spins where 1 is the origin of the coordinate system say. So, it is S1 SR and minus S1 SR okay. and that goes as exponential minus R over xi and we are interested in calculating xi. Okay. So, that is the whole idea and um, so it is easy to see that if I take the log of this, this is equal to minus r over xi that gives you that uh, 1 over xi which is called as a correlation length, we will write that. Uh, so, this is the correlation length. Simply stated is the distance over which the spins are correlated. So, this is equal to minus 1 over r uh, log of this thing and uh, we know that this is equal to uh, the, the gamma r is given in the top line. Okay. So, uh, this is minus 1 over r log of um, S r, S1 SR minus S1 um, S r and if you want you can take a mod of that, but it does not matter. So, this is what we have to calculate okay. and um, uh, suppose we are above T c. And uh, then uh, each of those S1 equal to SR that is equal to 0 because the average value of the spin there is 0. We are only taking that that the second term vanishes and in which case your uh, log of uh, gamma R is minus 1 over R log of uh, S1 SR just making things a little simple. Uh, and at the end we will see that it really does not matter if you uh, you know keep uh, or, or rather keep these terms. So, that is a constant term it is something like an m square kind of term where m denotes a magnetization. At this moment we will just uh, interested in calculating this thermal average S1 SR where 1 and R are two different sites. All right. So, uh, what is then S1 SR correlation? this is equal to uh, the sum over spins s and then uh, we have uh, S1 SR, this is how any thermal averages are calculated throughout the course we have seen that and you have a E n and then there is this S and this S in the curly bracket simply means that the all possible orientations of S which in this case is just plus and minus 1. Okay. And uh, then you have to divide it uh, by the uh, exponential minus beta E n which is the partition function of the system. Okay. This is simply 1 over z and uh, this s, uh, this curly bracket let us keep it and uh, it just means that uh, all the s's. Um, are they can take values plus and minus 1. So, e to the power minus beta E n and you have S. 
Okay. So, this is the quantity that we have to calculate and we will use the transfer matrix that we have learned and if you see that it is actually very simple in terms of the uh, transfer matrices. It is S1 and then all the transfer matrices because this has those values which are exponential. Uh, so, E n has this form which we have said it is equal to some uh, minus uh, beta I mean not beta, beta is here. So, it is equal to that H sum over um, I S i and uh, minus uh, J uh, and S i S i plus 1. Okay. And uh, so, these things can be written in terms of these uh, transfer matrices which are like T 2 3 and all the way T r minus 1 T r we go all the way up to this rth spin and then we write a S r and then we get a T r and all the way up to T n. Okay. So, these are the transfer matrices that we have seen I mean here I mean, and here as well. Okay, so, so, these are the transfer matrices that we have calculated. All right. So, uh, then uh, we can uh, you know easily uh, sort of simplify this because these are multiplication of 2 by 2 matrices and they simply uh, become equal to S 1 and there are R of them. So, it is T to the power R and the 1 R component and then there is a S R and then again uh, this N minus R of the transfer matrices and this is the R 1 component. Okay. And uh, so, this uh, then becomes equal to gamma of R becomes equal to using this, this is equal to minus 1 over R. Uh, see the expression that we have written in the last slide. So, this is a log is there log and then we have i which is not equal to 1 uh, not equal to r excepting these two. Uh, we have lambda i by lambda 1 uh, to the power r and we are now taking this u 1 s 1 and uh, u i um, u i s r u 1. Okay. Uh, u's are the eigenvectors of the transfer matrix. Okay. And lambdas are of course, the eigenvalues of the transfer matrix. You see there is a sum over i. Now, i cannot be equal to either 1 or r. Now, this a t to the power r um, the 1 rth element is nothing but this and this element is nothing but this and then we have to uh, sandwich uh, these uh, I mean uh, this means that this is actually equal to this and this is equal to this. Okay. Uh, the second uh, uh, this uh, expectation value. So, we are taking expectation value of uh, the S 1 spin uh, of course, S 1 can take pl values plus and minus 1 between the eigenvectors, the first eigenvector of these transfer matrix and uh, squeezed between the ith eigenvector, i is a running index and then this is the rth spin which again can take values plus and minus 1 and squeezed between the i uh, ui and the u 1. Okay. So, that is the r 1 value. Okay. So, uh, we just need to now calculate the uh, lambdas and the u's, but you see there is uh, uh, this one will only peak when i equal to 2. So, that is the, uh, the neighboring side where the correlations will be maximum. So, r uh, really would uh, you know this value would have a maximum uh, value or rather this uh, gamma r has a maximum value when uh, your i is equal to 2 which is the nearest neighbor of 1. Okay. And uh, so, if you calculate uh, u 1 and u 2, uh, let me also write down that this is maximum uh, when u i equal to u 2 okay. and this is an important thing. So, let me uh, do a 
box of this. All right. So uh, now uh, we can calculate u1 and u2. And when we do that, uh, we also need lambda 1 and lambda 2 and then uh, the gamma r which is the correlation function that comes out as lambda 2 by lambda 1 whole to the power r uh, e to the power minus 2 beta j and divided by um, e to the power 2 beta j uh, sin hyperbolic square beta h and uh, plus exponential minus 2 beta j. Okay. So, this is the uh, correlation function that we get and uh, this correlation function now can be analyzed and then if you put uh, h equal to 0 that is the uh, magnetic field equal to 0 uh, then this is nothing but so the this term goes away and uh, we have uh, a term which looks like a, a, you know a tan hyperbolic term and uh, this uh, then in that limit this looks like um, uh, so, this is for uh, beta equal to 0. So, that is like infinite temperature uh, where the correlation is not decaying at all, it is constant uh, at infinite temperature and it if you uh, at any finite temperature. So, um, finite uh, beta. Okay. So, this is gamma r plotted as a function of r. So, as you increase r the correlations fall down and then one can calculate. Um, so, uh, if you any finite beta you will have a fall off uh, from this and then uh, of course, at beta equal to 0 it is a constant line okay, which does not fall off and the correlation length now can be written as uh, so, xi is equal to or 1 over xi uh, inverse of that is minus log of uh, exponential beta j cosine hyperbolic beta h of course, at uh, h not equal to 0 and square root of uh, exponential 2 beta j uh, sine hyperbolic square beta h and uh, plus exponential minus 2 beta j. Um, and then divided by exponential beta j. I mean, this uh, log will have uh, both. So, exponential beta j cos hyperbolic beta h and a plus and this exponential 2 beta j sin hyperbolic square beta h plus exponential minus 2 beta j. Okay. So, uh, this is the correlation length and this correlation length is an important quantity in uh, the discussion of phase transition. So, um, you know if you have uh, at t equal to 0, if you are at t equal to 0, uh, then uh, you know uh, xi inverse goes to 0 which means xi uh, goes to infinity which means that there is, there is a phase transition. Okay, so, this means there is a phase transition and then at t going to infinity those are the two familiar limits for us. Uh, so, your xi inverse going to infinity which means that xi goes to 0 we have a paramagnetic phase. So, you can um, study the phase transition by looking at the behavior of psi. This is often done in uh, many phase transitions. So, this concludes the topic of this uh, transfer matrix and uh, let us now go on to another uh, topic which is called as a mean field theory. And what is a mean field? The word mean means of course, average that you know and uh, it sort of tells you that uh, we have many spins in the system and uh, what we do is that we consider uh, the effect of all other spins on a given spin as an average field. Okay? Think of uh, you know people sitting in the class 
and uh, one could be sitting very far away and one could be sitting very close to a particular student and um, the, the effective field on the students or the average field or the mean field on the student, uh, we replace the effect of all other students by a single uh, you know effective kind of field as if uh, the student is influenced by uh, someone who is sitting very far away and someone sitting very close by equally. Uh, so, this is called as an average field. So, what we are trying to get at is that if you have uh, a large number of spins and if you only um, uh, concentrate or focus on only one spin, uh, the presence of all other spins in that uh, you know system only poses an average field on this and uh, this you can understand that uh, this is um, uh, somewhat of an approximation because something which is very far away and something which is very close by of that particular spin which is under consideration, they should have different effects. But uh, this mean field theory neglects that and this is called as the fluctuations or the thermal fluctuations. So, the thermal fluctuations are neglected in mean field theory and because of this neglect of fluctuations, it often gives you wrong results. But in some cases, uh, particularly in higher dimensions like two dimensions and three dimensions, it gives you qualitatively uh, correct results even though it is quantitatively wrong. Unfortunately, in 1D, it gives a wrong result. Uh, it will give you a result a priori that uh, it has a spontaneous or 1D Ising model has a spontaneous magnetization in 1D. And in fact, uh, as we do this analysis, you will never see actually the dimensions coming by excepting through what is called as a coordination number and the coordination number indicates that how many neighbors that a spin has. So, in 1D one particular spin has two neighbors and in 2D it has 4 and in 3D it is 6 and so on and so forth. So, the only information uh, of the dimensionality of the problem enters through the z or the coordination number and so it is equally applicable in all dimensions. So, uh, and as I said in 2 and 3 dimensions it gives you uh, qualitatively correct results may be quantitatively uh, wrong, uh, wrong means it is inaccurate uh, and uh, the results that we are talking about is really a transition temperature at which a ferromagnet to a paramagnet transition. Uh, that occurs. So, it is a TC that we are more most interested in. Okay. So, uh, we know the strength of mean field theory now that it qualitatively can uh, reduce a very complicated spin pro uh, interacting problem not only in spins, but in other uh, areas as well. Uh, but however, uh, the limitations that uh, when the, uh, the fluctuations dominate then it starts giving wrong results and uh, in lower dimensionality the fluctuations are very large and that is why uh, the it, it gives you wrong results. So, um, what we do is that we uh, try to sort of uh, take an arbitrary spin um, at say uh, some SI and try to do uh, concentrate on that and uh, replace all other spins in the vicinity either 1, 2 or 3D uh, to be uh, as an I mean effective field. Okay. So, we write down S i equal to some uh, average value plus some fluctuations okay. and uh, in the quadratic case the fluctuations will be ignored uh, let us see that. So, uh, we have this delta S i which is this fluctuation is equal to some S i into S i average okay. that is the uh, fluctuation in spin. So, uh, we have a term which is like S i S j we are not writing uh, SI and SI plus 1 because we have committed that this uh, analysis is correct in any dimension. So, we will write I and J instead of I and I plus 1 and this is equal to uh, SI uh, plus a delta SI and uh, SJ um, plus a delta SJ and we open up the bracket and SI uh, SJ and then we have a S a J and a delta S i plus a S i delta S j and then finally a term which is um, a plus a delta S i delta S j and this being the fluctuation and in quadratic in fluctuation this can be set to be 
0 ok. So, these are two small quantities being multiplied and that is equal to 0. So, that is uh, really the approximation that we uh, that we count and um, uh, in some cases of course, this term cannot be neglected anyway we are leaving that and uh, we have now these uh, three terms that we have and um, we can again do a little bit of um, replace delta S i by these uh, uh, by this expression that you see here. Uh, so, you put it here and you put it here and then what one can get is this S j uh, S i and plus S i uh, S j and minus uh, S i S j average of both ok. So, what we do is that uh, we uh, sort of reduce an interacting problem that is two spins interacting uh, to a sort of non interacting problem where each spin is facing a field due to the other. So, uh, this is just a number uh, it is called a C number and this is just a number as well ok. So, uh, these two are numbers and you now have one spin and then becomes a non interacting problem it becomes a, a one particle problem uh, which can be solved exactly ok. So, within this approximation uh, we sort of uh, reduce the Hamiltonian and what we do is that we further assume that S i uh, equal to S j equal to m and uh, we have uh, seen this earlier that uh, when you have translational invariance you can write it down as a them to be equal that is uh, S i average and S j average are uh, equal and that is equal to m. Uh, just to remind you that these are uh, we are talking about the thermal averages ok. So, what does S i uh, S j it boils down to it boils down to m S i plus S j and a minus m square and then you can take a m common and you can write it as a S i plus S j minus m let us put a bracket here and this is the Hamiltonian the one particle Hamiltonian or the mean field Hamiltonian that uh, we get ok. And let us uh, write down this Hamiltonian and see that how uh, that can be solved. So, uh, we uh, write down the now the mean field Hamiltonian m f stands for mean field and this is equal to minus j m uh, we have a S i plus S j minus m and a minus h um, s i i equal to 1 to n and of course, here i j are nearest neighbors ok and uh, both of them actually go from 1 to n. And um, needless to say that s i uh, sum over i equal to s j sum over j in a translational invariant system uh, the space uh, does not matter in the sense that whether you talk about i site or j site uh, they would yield the same result ok. So, that tells you that uh, so sum over s i plus s j can be actually replaced by uh, just one index which is sum over twice sum over s i ok they being same all right. So, uh, now the Hamiltonian becomes even simpler or at least the look of it is simple and uh, which can be uh, written as minus j m and then there is a i uh, well I mean there is no j. So, we can simply write it as i and then we have a 2 s i minus m and minus h uh, s i and so on ok. So, i. Now, uh, what we will do is that we will replace this uh, sign uh, or rather the sum over i uh, as uh, you know uh, it is half um, sum over um, actually this uh, sum over when you have a i and j i j being the nearest neighbor and when you write it as 2 over s i uh, we can bring in a factor of 2 here because uh, i and j should not be counted twice. So, each pair should only be counted once and that is why in this term we uh, take a factor of uh, 2 there. So, this uh, can just be simply you know uh, this uh, it just becomes there is a factor of half and the mean field Hamiltonian really takes a simple form. Uh, there is also another uh, thing that comes here 
is that because you have a j, uh, so there is a sum over j along with the i, i j being the nearest neighbor and this sum over j really gives the z which is the coordination number, which is a number of nearest neighbor uh, you know spins uh, which need to be taken into account. So, we have a z that appears here. So, once when you go from a double sum involving nearest neighbors, so corresponding to each i there are j's and in one dimension there are two j's on either sides plus x direction and minus x direction. In 2 d we have a plus y minus y and 3 d we have plus x plus minus x plus minus y and plus minus z we have this z as a coordination number and this is exactly what I was saying that uh, the dimensionality information um, only uh, enters through this z and nothing else because it looks it is just a one particle Hamiltonian in any dimension. So, there is no really dimensionality that we uh, need to worry about. Okay. So, uh, we have this uh, problem now that uh, we have this Hamiltonian and this Hamiltonian can be a little, I mean can be further simplified and we can write it as n z m square uh, with a j term. Let me uh, sort of follow certain order of writing this m square by 2, there is a m there inside and there is a m outside there and there is a h plus z j m uh, and then there is a sum over i and s i okay, and uh, i of course goes from 1 to n. So, this is the Hamiltonian mean field Hamiltonian that we need to solve and uh, this will give us results that we have to you know analyze. Okay. So, uh, uh, let me just write z equal to 2 in 1 d equal to 4 in 2 d equal to 6 in 3 d. Okay. So, this can be written as uh, some h effective okay, where h effective is nothing but h plus z j m. All right, So, we can uh, solve this Hamiltonian and um, we can calculate the, uh, the partition function now. and the partition function yields um, z m f is nothing but a trace of um, exponential minus beta h m f. Okay. And this we know and uh, this is not difficult to calculate because we know that, uh, uh, so this is really like a product of i equal to all the sides basically or all the spins that are there. And then uh, we have this S i which uh, takes values plus and minus 1 and then exponential minus beta h uh, sorry it is not f m it is m f and this is what we have to calculate. And fortunately there is a closed form for this. Um, it is uh, really easy to do that. So, z m f is simply equal to uh, exponential minus beta um, n z j m square uh, by 2 and then the product of i equal to 1 to n and then we have uh, a sum over s i equal to plus 1 and minus 1 exponential beta h effective s i. Okay. So, uh, you have one part that factors out uh, which contains this uh, j term, uh, z is the coordination number, beta equal to 1 over k t, j is the nearest neighbor spin spin interaction, m is expectation value of s i or s j or of that uh, or any s. Uh, this actually gives you a 2 cosine hyperbolic uh, beta h effective. That is easy to see you just put a plus 1 and minus 1 here it will have a, a 2 cosine hyperbolic term. So, the z m f actually gives you a form which is exponential minus beta n z j m square by 2 and we have n of them because each one is a 2 cosine hyperbolic uh, h effective um, beta h effective. Uh, so, please write it neatly so that you are not confused. This is a cos hyperbolic term 
so this H and the H that you see afterwards are not the same thing. I mean, uh, in any case here it is H effective and this is the closed form of the partition function. So this tells you that uh, you are uh, very likely uh, to arrive at a solution which is in closed form and uh, we can now of course calculate the magnetization and uh, from the free energy that is you take the log of this uh, partition function multiplied by minus kt and then take uh, uh, del f del h. But what we can do also here is that we uh, have uh, we know this that m is equal to 1 over n i equal to 1 to n si average and we can calculate the SI average using the formula that it is a SI trace of exponential minus beta h divided by z and uh, this uh, is easy to see that it is equal to uh, sum over 1 to n um, a trace of SI exponential minus beta hmf and uh, divided by the ZMF that is what we have calculated and this is again equal to uh, 1 over NZMF and uh, we have a uh, sum I equal to 1 to N uh, SI into E to the power minus beta uh, HMF and uh, so uh, this uh, can be written as uh, 1 by n beta uh, 1 by zmf uh, del zmf uh, divided by del h effective and uh, we just show you that how we can write this that is coming from here to here uh, just show it in a moment and this is equal to 1 over n beta. Um, del uh, ln zmf um, and del h effective. So, let me show this step that comes. So, we have a del z uh, mf by del h effective and that is equal to del del h effective divide uh, into trace of uh, exponential minus beta h mf the mean field and this is equal to trace of uh, we can take it inside um, because the h effective is only there in uh, exponential minus beta uh, the, in the hmf. So, uh, this is trace of um, del del h effective and uh, we have exponential minus beta hmf and this is nothing but minus beta uh, trace of uh, uh, del uh, uh, del del h effective of h m f and exponential minus beta h m f ok and uh, this is equal to beta because you are taking uh, this uh, uh, del del h effective of h m f. So, this is equal to beta and you have a trace of uh, sum over SI um, and exponential minus beta HMF ok and that is what we have said here. So, when we came from the step uh, on the last bar point line to the uh, to the first expression on the left we have used this. So, this is fine and then now we uh, go and calculate log of Z um, mf which is equal to uh, from the expression that we have for zmf we can use that and we get this beta uh, n z and uh, j uh, m square by 2 and then we have uh, n log 2 uh, plus uh, n log of uh, 2 cosine hyperbolic beta h effective. Okay. So, del ln zmf by del h effective now that is the term that we have here uh, the last line that we are now calculating and this is equal to n beta tan hyperbolic beta h effective. Okay. So, 
we get this uh, magnetization now is equal to uh, tan hyperbolic uh, beta h effective. Okay. So, this is the expression that we uh, have to now solve. So, expression for magnetization. And why it is important? It is important because if m is non-zero, we have a ferromagnetic phase and f is f uh, m is 0, then we have a ferro uh, the paramagnetic phase. And uh, uh, so, uh, this h effective do not uh, miss that this is a combination of the actual h that is externally applied field and the z j m. Okay. So, this uh, H is uh, H effective is a combination of that, but now something interesting occurs here in this uh, last expression which is the expression for magnetization. You have to solve for the magnetization which is there inside the argument of the tan hyperbolic term. So, this cannot be solved uh, unless you solve it either iteratively uh, numerically or you uh, treat this as a transcendental equation and try to, uh, this is a transcendental equation of course, uh, and try to arrive at a graphical solution. And this is what we will do, instead of doing it numerically, we will do a graphical solution and let me uh, sort of sketch out the graphical solution uh, for, uh, you know, a, for some uh, particular values of, uh, for uh, fixed values of beta h z uh, and j. Okay. So, there is a graphical solution is what we uh, need to arrive at. Okay. And um, it is easy to see uh, that uh, there are uh, two regimes uh, where which are important, two regimes one regime is uh, you know your uh, beta z j is uh, less than equal to 1, it is less than equal to 1, uh, which tells you that uh, j over uh, or rather uh, k t um, over uh, z j is uh, greater than equal to uh, 1, okay? I mean greater than equal to so, which means uh, the thermal fluctuations dominate over the j term or the z j term. Now, you have to understand that there are competing uh, behavior that is uh, the thermal fluctuations will try to disorder the spins which means that they would uh, allow not to order and j will try to order. So, there is a competition and these two competitions are what we are you know looking at. So, one is uh, beta z j which is less than 1 and we have just put this less than equal to because um, the equality actually gives you a critical behavior. And the second region is important where you have a beta z j to be greater than 1. Okay. And this is where it is the other limit that is k t by z j is less than 1, which means that uh, the thermal fluctuations are subdominant and the interaction between the spins are dominant. Okay. Uh, if you uh, solve these uh, for uh, each one of them, then what we get is that we uh, get a solution like this. There is only uh, and you have, so let me show you what is this. So, uh, we have uh, this as the uh, LHS and this as the RHS and we are uh, solving um, the both sides of this equation. Okay? Uh, that is uh, like uh, you know and uh, so there is um, the both sides of the equation and you see that uh, for the first case uh, you have only a ordering uh, or rather these two plots they only meet at t equal to 0. So, which says that the ordering is only possible at t equal to 0. And for the other case, you see that uh, the plots would look like this. Once again, I am not drawing it very well, but it is a tan hyperbolic curve and you have. Uh, so, you have 
uh, only solution at t equal to 0 and uh, one solution at a plus m 0. So, this is uh, you know m basically and this is that minus m 0 and also at 0. So, three solutions corresponding to the second case. So, this corresponds to this and this corresponds to this. So, three solutions uh, at uh, 0 m equal to 0 plus minus m 0 and this is at m equal to 0 that is the only solution. So, we get um, you know uh, t equal to 0 is an idealized case. So, you see that there is no ordering possible, but very importantly we can uh, see that. Uh, uh, so, this is actually I forgot to mention this uh, please uh, take a note of this that we are talking about now h equal to 0 and explore whether uh, the model in any dimension has spontaneous magnetization. So, that is the question that we ask and try to answer. Okay. All right. So, uh, we put h equal to 0 and h equal to 0 it gives you uh, these two limits in one limit you have a solution only at uh, you know this uh, equal to 0 um, there is only one crossing at uh, t equal to 0 and uh, then there are two crossing three crossings rather one uh, is that uh, that ideal point. Uh, I mean this uh, m curve. So, this is your uh, LHS and this is your RHS okay. and uh, you can see this actually more uh, cleanly if you take the derivative. So, if you take the derivative of this so ddm of tan hyperbolic um, beta j z m. Um, and uh, look at this at m equal to 0 and then uh, you will see that this is greater than 1 or uh, you know this is or there are there is just one solution otherwise. Okay. So, we take the derivative of this term and uh, evaluate it at m equal to uh, 0 and uh, why we do that is that we basically look at this m equal to tan hyperbolic um, beta uh, z j m and then take a ddm of that and uh, evaluate it at uh, m equal to 0 this derivative and this derivative is greater than 1 for beta uh, j z uh, which is basically region 2 beta z j is greater than 1 uh, and it has just one solution for the other region. Okay. So, nevertheless what emerges finally is that there is a solution uh, at h equal to 0. And clearly that is a wrong result in 1 D. Okay. And of course, uh, because there is this uh, the ordering temperature in this particular case is nothing but is the K T C is equal to uh, Z j that is what we are. So, it is beta z j uh, when uh, m is uh, non zero. So, so your T c becomes equal to z j over k and in uh, in 1 d this T c becomes equal to 2 d 2 j over k uh, in 2 d it becomes equal to 4 j over k which is wrong. Uh, 3 d it becomes equal to uh, 6 j over k. So, this is completely wrong uh, qualitatively correct, but uh, it is wrong the numerical values are wrong this is like 2.27 from Onsager solution or 269 or something uh, j by k b and this again uh, is like 4 uh, j by k b uh, approximately 
Okay. So, you see that it is getting better and better as you go in larger and larger dimensions. Okay. All right. So, this is a contrasting result that we get in mean field theory and it is actually an inherent thing in uh, mean field theory. This transition temperature does not exist in 1D. Any infinitesimal uh, temperature would destroy ordering in 1D. That is the result that we got from the transfer matrix and uh, we should also uh, should have also gotten this, but then this becomes uh, you know infinitely wrong because the uh, thermal fluctuations dominate. So, uh, let me uh, just uh, one uh, last thing that we do here is uh, talk about the magnetization. And the magnetization uh, can be you know obtained at least for uh, T. Um, so, we know that the magnetization is 0 for T uh, greater than or equal to T c. So, the magnetization vanishes it does not order whether you have H or you do not have H. Uh, so, T c is given by as we say that T c is uh, Z j over k the Boltzmann constant. Okay. So, uh, that we look for this solution that we have already gotten m equal to tan hyperbolic beta z j m and uh, we uh, look at the zero field solution again zero field solution and uh, which means that h equal to 0 and the zero field solution gives that um, um, m is equal to uh, now the tan hyperbolic uh, x for small x can be uh, expanded as uh, x minus x cube by 3, x cube by 3 plus of the order of x to the power 5. So, these are all the odd terms that remain um, and this is equal to uh, uh, if you do that expansion of this magnetization term, then it is beta z j m minus one third uh, beta z j um, m uh, cube and so on. And so, now what we do is that we uh, do uh, uh, an expansion of this uh, really uh, at uh, t equal to uh, t c minus. So, we approach t c from the ordered side of the uh, transition, which means where it was ordered we approach it from there and then we have these uh, m to be equal to you know t c over t into m uh, minus one uh, third um, a t c over t whole cube and m cube uh, for uh, you know t uh, tending to t c from below. Okay. So, we uh, sort of uh, expand m, uh, this is of course for small m. So, expand uh, the self consistency uh, condition. I will tell you what the uh, self consistency condition is. Uh, the self consistency because we had to solve a transcendental equation uh, there. So, that is the self consistency condition. So, this is the self consistency condition. All right, so uh, we are uh, fairly done. Uh, accepting that, we uh, can you know uh, sort of take everything on one side, and this is of course for small m. Uh, this is uh, because you uh, expand it about m equal to zero, where the uh, as t comes to t c uh, either from below t c to uh, towards t c or above t c to um, towards t c, uh, the magnetization remains small. So, uh, we just simply do a bit of uh, simplification of that. So, it is a T c over T minus 1 minus 1 third uh, T c over T uh, whole cube m square uh, equal to 0 and um, uh, this uh, is uh, the equation that we get. And then if you solve this equation, it becomes plus minus root over uh, we have a 3 uh, t by t c whole square 
and T c minus T over T c uh, and this is how the magnetization behaves and you see as you put T equal to T c then of course, it goes to 0, okay? uh, but very close to uh, T c the behavior of magnetization with temperature is given by this formula. So, it is M uh, of T uh, at T tending to T c minus. Okay. So, this is the formula for that and then uh, one can do further um, sort of uh, analysis of that. Uh, in either case what happens is that we get uh, a scenario for uh, M to be like this. Okay. So, this is plus 1 and minus 1, this is M is being plotted as a function of T. So, this is T c. So, we are really uh, you know interested in knowing that what is the behavior here. So, this is the behavior here. Uh, I mean we have shown it, uh, let me uh, draw it that we are showing the behavior here when uh, T is uh, approaching T c from below okay? or uh, you know it, it can also be in the other direction that is, uh, that is fine. So, uh, the physical interpretation is that above the transition temperature, uh, the thermal fluctuations uh, are so strong uh, in 1 D that they completely um, uh, destroy any uh, magnetic ordering of the system uh, and then we uh, do not get any uh, sort of uh, uh, magnetically ordered or ferromagnetic phase. Uh, but however, uh, getting magnetization below T c in one dimension without magnetic field is a wrong result which is what we have said. So, uh, let me write this that a mean field theory is uh, qualitatively correct in higher dimensions but gives wrong result in 1D. Okay. So, this is uh, some uh, you know um, sort of uh, discussions of the magnetic uh, phase transitions in the interacting systems and it is uh, important to understand that the interacting systems are actually very important and they uh, form the basis of real uh, or rather when you uh, need to deal with real systems it is uh, it is quite important to take into account uh, interactions and we are giving only very simple examples where we are doing statistical physics and uh, arriving at solutions arriving at implications arriving at results which are of importance to us uh, one of the last things that we should do with uh, this uh, ising model is the renormalization group and uh, we will do it um, quite quickly, but the implications are very important and uh, this is also called as the uh, you know the uh, poor man's RG and uh, this was uh, invented by uh, Kenneth Wilson in uh, 1982. Um, or rather uh, it was uh, written down earlier and he got a Nobel Prize in 1982 for this discovery. In fact, one of the very few discoveries were uh, owing to a completely theoretical work one has uh, gotten a Nobel Prize. Okay? So, this is one of the examples of that. And um, uh, of course, we apply it to 1D Ising model and uh, show that uh, the result that we have intuitively got or we have gotten through the transfer matrix approach is correct and the mean field solution is wrong. Uh, but the whole idea is not to re-emphasize the same result uh, obtained again and again, but we are showing you different methods of uh, uh, dealing with interacting systems. Okay? Now, why is this renormalization group? So, what we do is that we take a 1 d ising chain and throw out certain degrees of freedom and cast the same system. So, suppose we throw out certain spins, we have uh, n spins and we throw out certain uh, number of spins and cast the same uh, Hamiltonian or the same system uh, in uh, as it was 
the, as the original one, but now with renormalized um, you know uh, coupling constant or renormalized j. Now, uh, if we keep doing that and we arrive at a stage that this coupling constant is not evolving that is it is remaining same that is the spins are experiencing uh, same uh, exchange interaction uh, even as you throw out more spins or if you include more spins at that particular you know uh, situation then uh, the system starts looking identical at all length scales. This has been sort of uh, cursorily talked about earlier that uh, this really talks about a phase transition because in a paramagnet if you look at a certain number of spins maybe uh, 5 of them could be up and 3 could be down and in some other region there could be uh, uh, you know 1 up and uh, 4 down and so on or 6 down. Uh, but uh, for a ferromagnet, if you look at 5 spins or 50 spins or 5000 spins or 50000 spins, they all look to be ordered along the same direction. Okay? So, at the phase transition, there is a scale invariance that occurs and this scale invariance is captured in our uh, renormalization group analysis through the uh, you know flow of the coupling constant. The flow stops the coupling constant does not evolve. So, if you have if you throw out more spins the system become uh, becomes more sparse, but however, this um, your coupling constant which is j it does not change anymore if you throw out more spins. It will become clear as I you know uh, write this down. So, let me write down the uh, partition function once again for this n spins and uh, we just write as a k and you know k is simply equal to j over k well k t yes this capital k is j over k t ok we just write in a slightly uh, shorter notation. So, it is uh, s 1 s 2 all of them to s n have values plus and minus 1 and we have this we started with a full uh, you know uh, where each uh, site is occupied by a spin. Uh, which has got plus minus um, 1 value. So, S 1, S 2, S 2, S 3 and so on and uh, well I mean S n, S 1 etcetera. Okay. So, the idea of this renormalization group or which is uh, you know in short called as R g is to remove degrees of freedom and assess the system whether it retains the identical feature or uh, what happens to the renormalized system in terms of the coupling constant between the spins which in this case we denote by k. So, uh, for that uh, we write down this um, partition function once again uh, in terms of this uh, s uh, 1, s 2 etcetera we you know what uh, to write and uh, write it pairwise. So, it is exponential uh, k uh, s 1 s 2 plus a s 2 s 3. Okay. So, we take pairwise and then take a exponential and uh, s 3 s 4 uh, k s 3 s 4 plus s 4 s 5 and so on and do it just pairwise keep doing it. Okay. So, now we can do sum over these spins which have values plus minus 1. Now, sum over only even numbered spins that is S 2, S 4, S 6 that is you perform the sum S 2 equal to plus 1 and minus 1, S 4 equal to plus 1 and minus 1 and uh, sort of let them leave the partition function uh, by explicitly summing over them. Now, these variables are no longer uh, would be there in that uh, in that uh, partition function. So, what we sort of look at is that uh, let us look at uh, number them as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, we will be left with 1, 3, 5 
in the next iteration. So, it is 1, 3 and 5. So, this have a coupling constant k, this have a coupling constant k prime if you write the same form as earlier and we want to see that how this k is flowing towards k prime whether we actually uh, achieve that the k prime is no longer evolving if we throw more uh, you know degrees of freedom out of the system and this is uh, in that case the system starts looking um, identical at all uh, all length scale length scales means these uh, difference between the spins are they denote the length scales and your k and k prime are dependent on that it is very easy to see that k prime is smaller than k ok. So, we uh, go from coupling constant uh, from a larger one to a smaller one as we do that. On the contrary if we uh, start uh, you know we start with a sparse system that is an empty system almost empty system and then start filling up you know the spins we would go from a lower coupling constant to a larger coupling constant but they uh, essentially they mean the same thing. So, uh, we have then um, you know for this n by 2 spins we then have uh, you know we have s 1, s 3 etcetera and which uh, can be written as um, this exponential uh, k s 1 plus s 3. Um, plus exponential uh, k uh, minus k s 1 plus s 3 this for the s 2 equal to uh, plus 1 and minus 1 and for the for the next term where we do it for uh, you know uh, sort of s 4 we get a s uh, k uh, s uh, uh, 3 plus s 5 and a plus exponential minus k s 3 plus s 5 and so on. You do it on the uh, even number of spins and uh, finally, what will happen is that uh, we would uh, have to reach or I mean if at all it is there, we have to reach a finite k c by doing further decimation of spins. Uh, that is you sum over more degrees of freedom that uh, you evolve your own algorithm that which are the ones that you are going to throw out from the Hamiltonian and write down the new um, uh, partition function for uh, you know n by 4 spins and n by 6 spins or, or uh, any number of uh, you know things that you want to throw out according to your algorithm and see that whether you reach a k equal to k c a critical coupling constant for which the iteration stops that is kc kind of saturates and does not uh, go to lower and lower values as you decimate more spins or uh, integrate out more spins ok. So, uh, we look for k and f k um, and a k prime a new new k or new coupling constant such that these exponential k s plus s prime that is any two spins this is for example, s and s prime where uh, s 1 and s 3 in the first term s 3 and s 5 in the second term and a plus exponential minus k s plus s prime that becomes some uh, function of f k and exponential k prime uh, s s prime. You see this is a, a quantity that we have to find out it is a function of the coupling constant, but this has the form of the original Ising Hamiltonian which is s s i s j original Hamiltonian. So, this we need to write the new problem the decimated problem at the first stage as the original problem in the second stage with a new coupling constant and some uh, quantity f k which we need to figure out. So, this can be done as the z uh, you know n k uh, is equal to um, so s 1, s 2, uh, s sorry s 3, s 5 etcetera uh, this is like a f uh, k uh, exponential uh, k prime s 1 s 3 f k um, exponential 
uh, k prime s3 s5 let me just do one minor correction here we have written this as n by 2 because we have uh, summed over the spins but let's at least at this stage let me write it still as n because this has the information that s2 has been summed over and s4 has been summed over and so on so we still retain this and then we have uh, these further terms okay so this can be written as f of k which does not include any of the s's and this is like a, a n by 2 and then we have a z n by 2 k prime and this is called as the uh, recursion relation or it is also called as the Kadanoff transformation. Okay, so, uh, we have to determine f k and k prime. Okay, how do we do that? We take these combinations s equal to s prime equal to plus minus 1 that is 1. So, that gives us exponential 2 k plus exponential minus 2 k is equal to f of k and exponential k prime and we take the other combination that s equal to minus s prime equal to plus minus 1. So, here they have the same sign 1 and in uh, 2 we have opposite signs which gives us 2 equal to uh, f of k uh, and e to the power k prime. Okay. So, there are two uh, equations and two unknowns okay or we can um, you know also write this say uh, let us let us write this as equation 1 I will write it with a larger one and these are 1 and 2 the normal fonts. Okay. So, uh, these uh, equations of course, 1 and 2 have two unknowns and there are two equations you can solve them. So, k prime becomes equal to half of uh, log of uh, cosine hyperbolic um, 2 k. So, that is the k prime uh, let us call this as equation 3 and I can also calculate f of k which is 2 uh, cosine hyperbolic uh, 2 k. Uh, this is equation 4. So, we uh, there are two unknowns and we could calculate both of them um, which relates the older coupling constant to the newer coupling constant and also these quantity f k uh, which uh, was introduced uh, a link between the, the original system and the decimated system. Okay. So, uh, we can write down a quantity uh, which is let us call it as a log of z uh, n k is equal to some n g k okay? uh, where g k is uh, like the free energy within you know a, a factor uh, k t okay? and, and a minus sign of course. So, let us write a minus k t. Um, now, uh, g k the free energy is of course, um, uh, extensive quantity, but since n is there g k is an intensive quantity that is it does not change as, as you change the number of particles volume etcetera. So, uh, let us write this down as equation 5 and hence we can go to this equation 1 uh, this capital 1 that we have written uh, we get uh, a log of uh, z n k is equal to n by 2 log of f of k plus log of uh, z n by 2 a k prime. Okay. So, this is uh, let us call it as equation 6. So, this is the, um, the relationship between the partition function of these uh, z n and z n by 2 and then if we uh, comparing uh, 5 and 6. Uh, g k is equal to half log of f of k plus half uh, g of k prime. 
okay. And uh, g of k prime is equal to twice g of k minus log of uh, 2 cos hyperbolic 2 k. Okay. And uh, let us uh, call this as equation 7. So, that is basically your g of k in terms of uh, g k, g of k prime in terms of g of k. Um, and uh, so, these are uh, you know called as this uh, 3, 4 and 7 are called as R g equations or they are called as flow equations because the coupling constant flows. Okay? I mean if the partition function is known for a particular k prime, uh, then one can generate it uh, using this recursion relation for, uh, for a k for a different k okay, uh, after one has done this uh, decimation. Okay? So, the inverse of this uh, R g equation that is uh, this we have written k prime in terms of k, but if you want uh, uh, this uh, the inverse ones then k is equal to half cosine hyperbolic uh, e to the power 2 k prime and uh, g of k. Uh, so, we have changed our variables from k f k to k g k. So, these are half g of k prime uh, plus half log of 2 plus k prime by 2. Okay? And this can be called as equation 8 and 9. So, they are uh, sort of similar things you just have to remember that uh, k is greater than k prime because summing over uh, degrees of freedom and you are throwing them out. Uh, if you do the reverse that is you are populating spins starting with a uh, sparse system uh, then uh, your uh, notions of k and k prime would increase. And in fact, let us uh, sort of start with an example in which uh, you, uh, do ha you have a sparse system so that we have k prime equal to 0 0.01 that is the coupling constant. So, you have a sparse system and we wish to populate. populated system. Okay. And uh, so, this here you have a z n uh, equal to 0 0.01 can be uh, sort of approximated at z n equal to 0 at uh, this 0 1. Okay. So, uh, this is 0 0.01 and it is almost 0 and this is known because z n if you have completely free spins, each of them have uh, 2 degrees of freedom which are half and uh, minus half, then z n is nothing but 2 to the power n. So, we can calculate g of 0 0.01 is equal to just log of 2. Okay? So, we give an example here again for the uh, 1D Ising model and uh, then um, if you start iterating equations uh, 8 and 9. Uh, then uh, we get, uh, so this is uh, the first stage we get it as k equal to 0 0.100334 and g of k becomes um, you know um, 0 0.698147. So, this first step you can just check by putting um, uh, this uh, k prime to be equal to 0 0.01 and, and these two values that we have said uh, z n is equal to 2 to the power n and g 0 0.01 equal to log 2. And then um, you know in the second step you get uh, k is equal to um, 0.327447. These are numerical numbers that you need to work out and convince yourself that these are correct and 0 0.745814 and uh, please do it for uh, 3, 4 steps more and see that where it is, uh, where it is going. You will see that actually the k that you get, the new k that you get is flowing towards infinity. Okay? So, which means that uh, this is actually called as a fixed point and it is a trivial fixed point. And along with there is another trivial fixed point called k equal to 0. Okay? So, what it means is that 
uh, as you uh, sum over the uh, sum de certain degrees of freedom, uh, the uh, these uh, coupling constant that increases more and more. We just saw just two steps here. It came from 0, uh, almost 0 0.01 to 0.1 to 0.3 and so on. If you go on doing it, it will become larger and larger and will eventually flow to infinity. So, there is no, there is no Kc uh, which means the system does not order order at any finite temperature. Okay. So, which means that the system flows uh, monotonically from uh, completely uh, sort of uh, order to uh, I mean, uh, so it, it basically it flows to a disordered state and it says that uh, if the fixed point does not stop that is uh, if fixed point keeps increasing or rather the, the uh, coupling constant keeps increasing then that means that there is only a ordering at t equal to 0 which is of course an ideal case. Okay. And um, so, uh, we go into uh, a state uh, from uh, uh, we start with a 1 D Ising model and we never reach an ordered state of the system at any finite temperature. Okay. So, uh, in any case the uh, if you do it uh, for the uh, I just mention it the results for 2 D Ising model and people have done this and one gets that uh, there is a ordering temperature. Uh, which is what even the mean field suggests or the transfer matrix suggests uh, where the expressions are a little more complicated. I am not deriving them, but just giving you the results and this is like a 4 k and uh, this is a g k prime is equal to 2 g k. The flow equations are like that uh, log of uh, uh, 2 uh, cosine hyperbolic 2 k. Um, to the power half cosine hyperbolic 4 k uh, to the power half uh, and this uh, and so the fixed point is obtained at k equal to some k c which is uh, equal to 3 by 8 a uh, log of a uh, cosine hyperbolic of 4 k c which is from the original uh, problem. So, k c uh, is equal to uh, 0.50698 and that is nothing but j by k t c. Okay. So, j by k t c um, agrees well with uh, the you know the uh, on Sagar's result. So, j by k t c uh, equal to 0 0.04406 uh, and you also get a 0 0.50698 which is not too, uh, this is uh, exact on Sagar's result. Okay. So, which means that uh, in 2D uh, Ising model there will be an ordering and there will be no ordering in uh, in 1 D Ising model as the uh, flow uh, goes all the way from 0 to infinity, there is no finite temperature at which uh, uh, there could be a ferromagnetic ordering in 1 D Ising model. However, it does in 2 D the results that you see are quite nice and uh, RG is not possible in 3 D and uh, the mean field uh, you know as numerical calculations are only uh, the guiding thing for, uh, for 3 D uh, whereas, it gives you a 6 uh, you know. Um, uh, so, j over k t c uh, is becomes equal to 6 or um, so t c becomes 6 j by uh, k. Okay. So, we will uh, stop the discussion on Ising model and uh, wish to pursue other things uh, in the interacting systems in the remaining uh, weeks that we have uh, for uh, this course. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.